Productions. The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe was first published in 1843 and depicts the ramblings of a person as they recount their murder of an elderly man with a vulture eye. In this inaugural episode, we will discuss our initial encounter with the Telltale Heart and thoughts coming back to it now, as well as the strange narration style and theme of the story. This is Analytical. <laughs> Hello! Hello, hello. I'm Hannah. And I'm John, and we are your new favorite literary nerds. So John, tell me what you thought about this story. The first thing I noticed while reading The Telltale Heart was the length of the story. It's very short. Even for a short story, it is remarkably short. The first thing I really noticed when I was reading it was that it wasn't as spooky as I thought it was. When I first read it, I was in seventh grade. It was for an English class, and when I reread it, I was like, this just wasn't as scary. You've never really dealt with scares very well, though. <laughs> I definitely have not been a very good, like, horror movie watcher or scary movie goer at all. But at 12 years old, this was way creepier than it was this time. You might be right. When I think back on the Telltale Heart, I always imagine something longer and something definitely more creepy. This is... This kind of just hits you right in, like, it punches you in the mouth. Just like, boom, here it is. Whereas when I was younger, I, I remember a buildup. I remember more of a buildup. See, I do too. I feel like whenever I thought back on it, I was like, you always heard like the boom, 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 boom in the background. And maybe that was just the version we saw. Like they added that because it was first published in 1843. So there have been, you know, retellings and reworkings of it. So possibly we did see a different version where they did build it in more. Yeah, that's for sure. I, I think literature is kind of malleable almost yes it's very in interpretable is what the word i was oh, looking okay. for and you can interpret how you want to and you can definitely tell that and especially this isn't exactly a poem it is a short story but it's very beautiful writing it's very scriptful and that's goes for a lot of poe's work he was a poet first and foremost i think so this might be a short story but it is it's a poem in everything but rhyme i mean but you can just have prose poems so it could be like you can interpret it as a poem for sure i can see that one thing I want to point out is that we immediately start with a speaker who's almost addressing the reader. So when we talked about that like strange narration style, it's just instantly you're like, who are we talking to or who is talking to us and who is you because it says you. And when we jump down to like the end of the story, you do see quotations when he's addressing the police. So it's like, do we actually know who the speaker is and what the context of the story is? Is it just him talking to like a creature or something he sees as a manifestation of his guilt? Or is it him talking to us as the reader? I think the not knowing definitely lends something to the creepiness of the story. Like just the fear of the unknown, kind of. Yes, the fear of the unknown. It's just definitely scary. Humans like to know things. No, for sure. I definitely think that fear of the unknown is a theme they even play on in the story with the old man being, you know, kind of woken up by the killer coming in and he sits up for an hour, it says, or for hours just being awake and just that fear is almost palpable to that killer. Poe does play on that in the story. Mm-hmm. So jumping um, a little bit different of a point now, why did he want to kill the man? Like, that's an interesting thing you see. It does talk about his vulture eye and, like, that the eye kind of scared him, which we're going to do a little bit of medical spin on this because I remember talking about it in seventh grade was that it would have been, like, a cataract eye. So it would have been, like, glossed over and which would have been really common in Poe's time. Elderly people just suffered from cataracts. They still do, but now he can fix them. The killer is frightened by this eye, but then... My question is kind of like, why? Why was he frightened of this eye? Because it would have been probably pretty common in this time it was written and published. Yeah, he just had a cloudy lens, right? That's yeah. what a cataract is. Yes. Yeah, I think a central point to the whole story is the unhingedness of the narrator that we see. He starts off with ramblings. He starts off by shouting the word true. Like, I mean, it's not a very sane man he doesn't come across as, even though he does try to convince us this. He claims that I was never crazy. I never did anything that I didn't know I was doing. I don't think planning someone's murder and stalking them and coming to the bedroom for a week at night is the acts of a sane man. But the way he says it is just like, yeah, this is like my normal Tuesday. Like, this is what I do. And with that, yeah, he did try to point out, like, I am a sane person. I do know what's going on. And he even, like, it was premeditated. So, you know, if this was a uh, transcript to the police, well, now they're docking up his charges because it was premeditated. A little bit of 
law and order on us. I don't think he's trying to convince us so much as himself that he wasn't crazy. Like, he's trying to explain to himself, I think, more than us, why he killed the man. I like that thought. Although then it sounds like he's trying to justify the murder to himself. Which, of course, he probably is, like, if he is that guilty. So, no, it sounds like he's trying to justify the murder to himself, which, if he is feeling so guilty, which we kind of get at the end of the story where he is hearing the heart... Which is the telltale of the heart. Ooh. <laughs> Title alert. So we see the manifestation of his guilt with him just constantly hearing the heart get louder. And he's like, the police are going to hear it. They need to get out. And he tries to get the police out so they won't hear it. But he's the only one who hears it. So that's the manifestation of his guilt. So I do think we're kind of seeing this story out of order. Where the beginning is him kind of rambling and he's recounting the story. And not just seeing the story as it goes. I would definitely agree with that, and I would like to state that he invited the policemen in and was the reason they were there for longer than they had to be. He is what led to his own downfall. He, he was his own worst enemy in this sense. Like, he was like, yeah, come in, we get, and he led them on a tour of the house, basically, and then he put his chair right over where he buried the man, and then he was just like, oh, I can do it. I, I'm definitely not crazy, and then his craziness once again got him. I would also like to point out that we never actually do see if the speaker is a man. Um, I kind of see it almost as like Poe writing from a point of view of himself. So I would like call it a he. We did say they in the beginning just as a general neutral pronoun because we really don't know what gender or sex the uh, killer is. We don't ever get told what gender the narrator is, but I think it's very safe to assume that it is a man because... This is Poe we're talking about, and I think that's very important to take into consideration, is the author. So Poe wasn't necessarily a feminist by any means. He didn't write very much feminist work. He's not renowned for his feminist work. He's just not. For psychological writing, you look inwards. So I think it's very safe to assume the narrator in this story is a man. But it could be a woman. And I think that the gender isn't the focal point of the story. It's definitely not, but I think it would be interesting if you saw it as, like, it was the elderly man's... Because we do know that the victim was a man. So if it was his wife who killed him, so she's like, I went in there and looked at him. But, again, I don't think it is. Um, there are some other short stories where they do depict women as the, like, killers. And you can usually tell immediately that it was a woman, either by other female characters in the story, or the police would have indicated that it was. So as as much as I don't like to say it, the usual norm is a man, especially for Poe, as John said. Yes. I think the gender isn't the focal point here because Poe wanted to write from a point of view of anyone. I think the story, if we're digging really deep, which we are, can be said about anyone. Anyone can suddenly become unhinged one day. Anyone can be crazy, I think. Anyone can deal with mental illness is a better grasp of that, but anyone can be crazy is good enough. Anyone can just lose their crap at any moment and kill their elderly person they're caring for. Maybe not, you know, nowadays, but it could happen. Which is interesting that you point out that you, uh, that he was caring for the elderly man. I don't think it ever specifically says that, so that's an interesting interpretation, I think. That is a question I was kind of thinking of while we were talking about this, is why was the elderly man living in his home, or was he living in his home? Was it his neighbor? Again, we don't really get a clear understanding of that, but I think it is a, another assumption we can make that he is living in the home with him. Well, especially when a story like this is so short, you do have to make those assumptions, and I think the safe assumption is the one that jumps out the most to you. And of course, we can always dig deeper, which is kind of what we do here, and we can find out some deeper meanings to take from this for today's time as well. So with that nice segue, we're going to talk a little bit about mental illness becoming a physical illness, which I think is one of the central themes. So whenever we kind of talk about the theme of the telltale heart, you can obviously see that manifestation of guilt is one. But you can read that into it a little deeper as mental illness becoming a physical illness, as we see with him, you know, kind of just jumping out of his skin to tell the police what's going on. And he's physically hearing the heart beating, but obviously it is not because the police really don't indicate that they hear anything. They are still jovial and sitting calmly, but he is kind of scrounging to get them out as fast as he can. Yeah, without a doubt. And I'm going to take a step back from that point of view, actually, and say that he doesn't necessarily think anything's wrong with him, but you can obviously tell something is. So the point you made earlier that this transcript, if it was given to a police officer, would put him in worse trouble, I think it would get him out of trouble, because anyone reading this could say, wow, he is insane. And that 
you know, criminal defense is a defense. I like the insanity plea here. Another plain to see theme point that I see in this story is the ticking of time. And you see that with the onomatopoeia of the clock ticking, which is the heart, obviously. And you kind of see it as old man, and then the narrator is described as younger in some sense because he's talking about this man as old, and he might even say that he might be younger. You can kind of interpret the story to be about the same guy. Okay, I'm going to jump in here. I can kind of see what you're saying about it being about the same person. So possibly, yes, this younger man did kill someone, and now he's an old man. And maybe whenever they said I, this old man was sitting up, he's seeing himself, like, again, as the young man coming in. That's an interesting kind of viewpoint to have on it and something I definitely didn't think about the first time. Yeah, and the, the tick ticking just really makes you think of time and the heart is the the comparison of a heart to a timepiece is pretty prevalent, you know, that is your that is your timepiece personally, as a human. And it does in the beginning it kinda of talks about he hears different sounds and so not only the sounds of the heart. He says he hears sounds from heaven, he hears sounds from hell. He definitely his hearing is something he kind of focuses on to show that he's not mad by his words. And so I do think that the time of the clock chiming, it goes into back to his hearing. The sounds he's hearing could definitely add to the theme of it being the same guy. Because as you get old, you lose your hearing. So maybe this is just an old guy recounting on his life and he really is feeling guilty for it. So maybe the story is less physical than we are making it out to be. And it's more just the internal psychoanalysis of this man. For sure, and then just to go to the end of it, the only thing we ever see him physically say, I'm just going to quote it real quick, is, yes, yes, I killed him. Pull up the boards and you shall see I killed him. But why does his heart not stop beating? Why does it not stop? This is Edgar Allan Poe, 1943. <laughs> Cite your sources. But the why does it not stop, the why does his heart not stop beating, he could just be talking about his own. And, like, that's what he's hearing over and over again as he kind of goes through these moments in his old age. He just keeps hearing his own heartbeat. And even if we say it's not old age, while he's sitting there talking to the police, he could be hearing his own heartbeat as a young man as well. It just would be so loud if he's nervous. You know, it's thundering in his ears. Um, if you've ever been nervous before, you kind of feel like you're overwhelmed and you hear your heart beat really loud. I agree with that. I think also, I've really fallen in love with this idea of it being the same man, so I'm going to go back to that real fast. As you get older, your hearing slips, like we said in the beginning, and also your mind. So maybe he wasn't at quite as crazy as coming off across as he is now as he, when he was younger. Maybe in his old age, he's misremembering some things, and he just feels terrible for killing someone. And maybe the policeman can be seen as a judge figure, or maybe even God himself, and he's so worried about this murder coming in the clear, and he feels so guilty for it, and he's so worried about his life. And you interpreted the heart to meaning he was ready for death, but I could interpret it as everlasting life, which is most often compared to an afterlife. So the policemen are God in this comparison, and he's so afraid of them finding out, but, and I think this is a very religious outlook, but he is just so ready to reveal what happened, and that's what he finally does in the end. He says, look upon it. No, that's an interesting point with the look upon it, too. Uh, I will just like to point out real quick that he, there are some other quotation of like spoken word there's some uh, the who's there die die so the last sentence is not the only one that is spoken but it does seem to be the most prevalent to me when there's only three sentences of dialogue and they're not separated out from the rest of the text that last sentence seems to be a little bit more highlighted with it being at the very end and it being the last thing you read for the story I agree, but another viewpoint on that is that since it's a retelling of a story that happened in the past, the narrator isn't really looking to tell the exact story of what happened. It's not a dialogue story driven. It's just this happened, then this happened, and then I remember this phrase because it was so important to me. That's true, and another thing to note is that with it being a first-person narration, we kind of have an unreliable narrator. All narrators are inherently unreliable unless they give you some fact to back up their reliability. So we can interpret this really any way we want to, and we can say he's lying. We don't have to believe what he's saying at face value. Well, John, is there anything else you'd like to talk about with this story? There's certainly more analysis that can be done on any story. I'm not going to say the story is picked to the bone, but I've made all my points, and I think you might have too. <laughs> so, listeners, definitely reach out to us if you had a contrasting, or maybe just to agree with us. I don't know. 
reach out to us. Let us know what you thought of this story. We can be found at Instagram at analytical with an I pod at Twitter at analytical with an I pod. So it's A N A L I T I C A L pod, all one word. And you can find us at Facebook at analytical pod. And we'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you for listening. Hope you guys enjoyed. Analytical is created, hosted, and produced by Hannah and John Newland. It is edited by John Newland. The artwork was created by Hannah Newland using Logo Maker and is owned by Hannah and John Newland. The theme music you're jamming to now is created by John Bartman, and you can check out more of his work at his website, johnbartman.com. Web design is by Hannah Newland, and you can find us at analyticalpod.wixsite.com slash analytical. And you can find that link in the description. All our social pages are at analyticalpod, and you can email us at analyticalpod at gmail.com to reach out and discuss your thoughts on this episode, to chat about literature, or life. Please rate and review us, and subscribe to our podcast, and tell your friends. It will help other people find and enjoy as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time as we discuss The Story of an Hour by Kate Chopin.